Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, uh, sorry, we started a few minutes late. Uh, this is uh, my name is Shabi Musa. I'm the uh, executive coordinator of the African Forum for Primary Health Care. And this is a um, give me a second. Uh, so this is basically uh, a, a CPD meeting. Um, and we're really fortunate to have uh, Dr. Tim Meyer, um, who's a gastroenterologist in pediatrics at the University of uh, Witwatersrand and at Rahima Musa Hospital in, jo in Johannesburg. And he's going to talk about an approach to uh, pediatric malnutrition. Um, and we're really pleased. So just before we start and I hand over, um, let me just give Tim the chance to slide, share slides. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'm going to just check on a poll um, and see what we, who we've got around the table so that Tim has a sense of who's around here before he starts. Um, so if you can please uh, just um, use the poll to tell us where you're from, who you are, and um, some details. Really great. Thank you. Please, uh, if we can get at least to half of the 26 people so far, I think uh, we'd really be pleased. So um, over to you, Tim. Um, while we're doing that, I think we're getting a couple of people on. I think we can share it in a few seconds. All right. I think. Okay, we've got almost half the people here. So let me just quickly share that. Um, so most of them are interns, uh, some fam a family physician and medical officer. Um, some others, but also most of them are from Southern Africa in Gauteng, particularly one from Western Cape, um, Johannesburg and West Strand in, in, in uh, Gauteng. So that's basically the mix of people in this meeting um, for now. I think others have joined and others have not contributed. So hope that helps you, Tim. Over to you. Thanks, Tim. Are you managing with your voice, uh, Tim? I think you're not mute. You're muted. Oh, okay, I unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> not used to Zoom. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thanks, Prof. Musa. Uh, yes, I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist. I work at Rahima Musa Hospital, and um, actually got my my way into pediatric gastroenterology was because it was the specialty that dealt most with nutrition and malnutrition was was one of my interests and um, one of, it was a topic of my research as a registrar. So um, I'm hoping that I can share some interesting things with you. I've tried to keep it quite broad. So we will um, talk a little bit about the more community pediatric um, public health point of view, but also about the physiology and, and the principles of management. Um, please stop me if there's anything that's not clear or if there's anything you want to ask. Okay, so I see lots of you who are interns, so you're definitely way too young to remember this photo. Um, this is a, a photo that actually won the Pulitzer Prize it was taken by Kevin Carter, who's a, who was a South African uh, photographer who documented a lot of the um, apartheid, uh, in the end of apartheid violence and that. Uh, so he's a proudly South African photographer who went to Sudan and um, took this photo of a dying child. And that was uh, at the time when there was war and famine in Sudan. And he had to leave with the aeroplane shortly after taking this picture. Um, got a lot of criticism for not doing more, but I don't know what he could have done. And unfortunately, commit suicide um, a couple of years after winning this Pulitzer Prize. So I suppose it's a little bit of useless background information, but I think we all know this, this picture, this type of child. We've all seen them. And unfortunately, my impression is that we, I guess we never really stopped seeing the severely malnourished child like this, but definitely in my experience, there's been a few cases that we can definitely relate to COVID lockdown, um, worsening of poverty and unemployment. 
So definitely not a topic that is not important anymore. So this is just an overview of my talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about the etiology, the epidemiology, and like I promised, move into the physiology and the management aspects of things. Okay, this is a very old slide now, and I think it still holds true. It's uh, the UNICEF Framework for Severe Acute Malnutrition, does as it was just called, malnutrition. And they looked at what are the actual causes. And you might think, well, it's obvious you're not eating enough. And indeed, that's one of the immediate causes. The other things that go along with it is disease, um, diarrhea, anorexia because of uh, inflammation. Um, and obviously, the malnutrition feeds into infection as well. So a vicious cycle there. And then if you look at the more underlying causes, it's a lot to do with unhealthy, unclean environments, uh, lack of sanitation, lack of adequate um, toilet facilities, etc., and inadequate access to food and uh, inequality in amongst our population. And above that, if you go even further, then it's really looking at resource control and politics and the causes of our severely unequal society. Um, the result is, is this. So these are all children that I've treated. It's, um, these are children with koshioko, as we used to call it. And the typical features of the peeling rash, the severe edema, uh, weeping dermatitis, and this pigmented rash, and we still see that today. And of course, the counterpart is what we saw in that picture by Kevin, um, you know, Kevin Carter, um, is marasmus, the severe wasting. And it's a very different clinical syndrome, even though both of these result from inadequate intake and, and infections. The clinical picture of edema and swollen bellies and kwashiorkor um, seems quite separate from what we see here, which is just severe wasting no subcutaneous tissue, but relatively intact skin and mucous membranes. And the debate as to why children develop one or the other is uh, still ongoing. So I also like to mention this lady over here, Cecily Williams, and I would encourage all of you, if it interests you, to look up this lady and, and read up her story. She's fascinating. So she was the first woman uh, physician to graduate from Oxford in the UK. And really the only reason that she got a, a, a post or a, a space as a medical student was because all the men were at the First World War. So they had to take a woman and, and she became one of their first doctors. She moved um, across the world, but spent quite a lot of time on the Gold Coast in Ghana, and or what's now called Ghana, um, then was called the Gold Coast Colony. And she described for the first time what we now know as kwashioko. So in fact, she coined the term kwashioko, which means something like the disease of the displaced child or the disease that one child gets when the next one comes along and um, linked it to cessation of breastfeeding and, um, and wrote her thesis on it and published this article in the Archives of Disease and Childhood in 1933. And what you can see is saying it, breast milk is probably deficient in some factors. At the moment, we don't know what it is. Oh, thunder and lightning very close by. I hope I don't lose my internet connection. Um, so she thinks that the local diet is just not adequate. They relied a lot on maize, as we do in South Africa. And she thought it's not very rich in protein. Um, and she didn't think that it was a, a particular vitamin deficiency. And although some of the features of kwashioko look like pellagra, she didn't think this was pellagra. And this paper got a huge backlash. And um, 
lots of people said, no, this is definitely uh, Pellegra and you're just re-describing it. Um, people didn't believe her. But what also happened is some of the formula companies jumped onto this saying, haha, the local food is protein deficient. And of course, the best remedy that we can give is formula feeding and, um, and it's got lots of protein. And in fact, protein or, or formula feeding did treat Kwashiorkor or successfully. So they actually then really moved into some very um, unethical practices, starting to promote formula feeding in places like Ghana and the rest of Africa, where there was no access to safe drinking water and electricity to boil water, etc. And uh, they definitely did more harm than good. And to this day, that's why we now have um, milk replacement policies in terms of advertising. Companies are not allowed to provide free samples and have to be very careful in advertising and have to mention on each and every tin that breastfeeding is still the, the best way of feeding a baby. But I think they do have a lot to answer to in terms of malnutrition in Africa and across the world. And, uh, and this lady recognized that. So shortly after she described this um, disease, the qualification of um, malnutrition was being formed. And um, this is what we, or what I learned as a medical student, uh, probably the interns didn't learn this. It was based on the percentage of expected weight that your baby is, and based on the presence of edema and other typical signs of kwashiorkor. And then you got classified as either normal, like the baby in the middle, or marasmic if you're just wasted, or kwashiorkor if you've got edema, or marasmic kwashiorkor if you've got edema and wasting. And that was the classification for many, many years. So as a little aside, we still haven't really decided what the cause of kwashiorkor is. And I mentioned we don't know why some children develop this edema, etc., and others develop wasting only. And there have been lots of theories that come and that came and went. So we talked a little bit about pellagra. Um, there have been trials that treating with vitamin B3 does not improve the outcome of kwashiorkor, thinking that probably it's not that. Um, and for a long time, everyone accepted that protein deficiency is the cause. So it was mentioned by Cecily Williams in the very early days that maybe it's protein. She didn't say definitely it's protein. And she reasoned that albumin is formed from protein that you take in your diet. And therefore, all these children with kwashiorkor have got low albumins. Maybe they've got low protein intake. And, and that's why um, they developed kwashiorkor. But since then, we have moved a long way. Um, the recommended daily allowances for protein are revised almost every year, and they tend to get lower and lower um, than we th previously thought. They also looked at intakes, um, historical intakes of children who developed kwashiorkor or marasmus, and they found there was no difference in the amount of protein that they took in. Um, and then some people thought, well, maybe it's specific amino acids, conditionally essential or essential amino acids. Um, and this was thought to explain some of the um, clinical features um, seen in kwashiorkor. And they said supplementation of these amino acids seems to hasten the disappearance of edema. Um, I think what I haven't, so what I just want to add there is there, there were trials looking at protein supplementation and showing that, in fact, again, there was no difference in the amount of children that developed kwashiorkor and marasmus after protein supplementation. So then people came up with the oxidative stress theory, the free radical hypothesis. So you've got insufficient um, 
pre or oxid antioxidants, I should say. So we don't have enough vitamin E, we don't have enough vitamin C, we're short of glutathione, um, etc. in children with kwashiorko. And then when they develop an infection and they develop all these free radicals, they unable to neutralize the free radicals and then they get lots of capillary leakage, etc. And that's how they explain the edema and the features of kwashiorko. So again, a very elegant trial disproved this in 2005. They enrolled a vast amount of children. It was a prospective study. So they gave an antioxidant cocktail to half of the children and a placebo to the other half. And then they followed these children up prospectively. And they saw that in fact, the study group, the ones that got to antioxidants developed exactly the, or even a little bit more um, Kwashiorkor than the placebo group. So antioxidants was not the answer either. We continue to look for what the cause is, and this is another very interesting uh, take on things. This is looking at the fecal microbiome of mice, um, oh sorry, of um, patients with Kwashiorkor. And what they did is they looked specifically for families where there were twins and where one twin had kwashiorkor and the other didn't. And they harvested the stool from each of those twins and they instilled the stool into the gut of gnotobiotic my mice. Now gnotobiotic mice means essentially these are mice that are raised in a sterile environment. They're born by cesarean section. They never get any or they, their food is sterilized. They're not exposed to the outside, etc. So they have no microbiome in their guts until they introduce the feces of these twins. And then they fed these mice a typical Malawian diet. And the mouse that got the microbiome of the twin with kwashiorkor developed malnutrition, whereas the other mouse did not. Then they gave ready to use therapeutic food, which is one type of uh, supplementation to treat malnutrition. And in fact, both mice did okay. And then they went back to the Malawian diet and the same mouse got malnourished again. So very interesting then that maybe kwashiorkor is an infectious disease and it's got to do with an unhealthy microbiome. Um, this is a proof of concept study. So it really, you'd struggle to explain why one mouse um, developed a malnutrition if it wasn't due to the, the microbiome. Okay, so that was a little bit of esoteric talk about the causes of kwashiorkor and marasmus. And I think just to highlight the last thing is I still see in many textbooks and in many papers, um, people talking about protein energy malnutrition. And really, we should forget that term. It's not protein, it's not energy, it's everything. It's micronutrients, it's macronutrients, it's fatty acids, it's minerals, it's everything. And um, the misnomer has probably led to a delay in, in advance in this field. Okay, so this is a little bit of South African stats. So we're looking at children in 2014, 2015, divided into three age group, the very young ones, six, to two, six months to two years, three to four, and then um, all of them together. And then we look at the different forms of malnutrition. So the first thing that should be obvious is that the most common form of malnutrition is in fact stunting. And this has been shown quite nicely by the, the birth to 20 study group as well, that we've got a very high percentage um, of stunting in children from six months to two years. A quarter of children in South Africa, in fact, are stunted in that age group. And then they, they tend to catch up a little bit when they get to the three to four year age group. But it probably has very significant impact on their cognitive function, and et cetera, um, that they are malnourished in those first few years of life. Stunting is really a marker of nutritional status but also of hygiene and sanitation and access to water in communities. 
So what we see is, and what we um, often refer to as environmental enteric dysfunction is children who grow up in perhaps in a township where there is no water, there's a long drop, um, there's no, you know, people can't wash hands, etc. And these children have recurrent subclinical gastrointestinal infections. And a major outcome in these children at the, is that they don't grow as well vertically as they should. So they are stunted. Um, and, and that's the most common form of malnutrition that we see. Underweight, um, I always say underweight is kind of a, a combination of either you're too short or you're too thin um, or both. Uh, so it, it's not very discriminatory. And then there's wasting. And wasting is really when we talk about severe malnutrition, we're talking about wasting diseases. And as you can see, there's still a good number of children in South Africa that are wasted, especially in the two to um, half to two year group. Um, but it doesn't show the prevalence of severe acute malnutrition or severe wasting in this slide. And obviously the broken record of our South African society is the relationship between um, inequality and malnutrition. And in this case, it's looking at stunting and you can see the clear difference in the amount of stunting in the poorest quintile versus the richest quintile. And I don't think that comes as any surprise to any of us. So then for the more the younger doctors. Um, in 2009, the WHO came along and said, you know, this Marasmus and Kwashioko is old school. Um, we need to talk about severe acute malnutrition and moderate acute malnutrition. And this is to distinguish it from chronic malnutrition, which is uh, mostly um, marked by stunting or shortness. This is looking at wasting more. So if your weight for hard Z score is below the third centile or below minus two, but not below minus three, then we call you moderate acute malnutrition. If it's less than minus three, we say severe acute malnutrition. If you've got edema, so the old kwashioko, that's also severe acute malnutrition. And then they added this handy tool, which is the mid-up arm circumference. And then you see it in action in the right bottom picture where you can really get untrained health workers um, or community workers to catch children between six months and five years and put this tape around their upper arm. And if the mid upper arm circumference is less than 11.5, then we call that severe acute malnutrition. And there's very good correlation um, between the mid upper arm circumference and overall wasting of a child and is in specifically muscular wasting. So this also kind of gets rid of the fact that your weight is affected by edema or by dehydration. So you can falsely classify someone if you use weight for heart. And um, like I said, it's very useful in, in poorer resource settings where you might not have access to scales and accurate measure, measurements. So why was this wasting emphasized so much? And this is, is really the crux of the matter. This is a, a picture just depicting the relative mortality of children with different degrees of wasting. So different degree of thinness. So if you're... Um, more than minus one Z scores, meaning you are not thin, uh, you're in the top 75% of normal um, weight for your heart, then you, we call your odds ratio of dying one. And then we look at the relative odds ratios of dying for those that are more thin. And even if you're still within normal, but you're not in that top 75%, your odds of dying were 1.7 times higher. As soon as we're talking about moderate wasting or moderate acute malnutrition, 2.3 times higher chance of dying. And as soon as we look at the severe wasting, the severe acute malnutrition, you're 9.4 times more likely to die than someone who's not wasted. So this is really why 
we want to know when I admit a patient to my ward, I want to know what is their weight for height. I can look at their weight, I can look at their length, and that can tell me more about how the baby has been growing in the past, particularly if I've got multiple time points. But right now, I want to know, is this child wasted? Because that child, if you're severely wasted, needs to be monitored very closely and needs to be managed for acute malnutrition. Okay, a little bit about physiology. I hope you're not yawning when you hear physiology, uh, but I think it's important to base our understanding of the management of, of malnutrition on, on a little bit of physiology. So what happens in children who do not have ad adequate uh, nutritional intake? So the first thing is your body goes into a catabolic state. You start breaking down fat and later on you start breaking down muscle. Now, of course, babies and children don't have as much of a fat store as me. So they're going to break down muscle much sooner um, after shorter periods of starvation or of inadequate intake. And then as you start running out of those reserves, the body starts shutting down metabolic processes and starts conserving energy. So we're not going to put our energy into, into growth and activity if we don't have enough. We're going to decrease the activity of our ATP pumps um, and our protein turnover. And um, we're going to reduce our inflammatory responses because we just don't have enough energy to go along. So that's called reductive adaptation. And it, it results in reductions of gluconeogenesis. So now you're no longer making enough glucose. You're not making protein. That's why your albumin's so low. Um, you're starting to retain sodium and fluid because your sodium potassium pumps are not working as well. Your heart muscle gets wasted just like other muscles. Your gut starts shutting down as well. So um, the gut is actually a very highly metabolically active organ and you stop producing as many enzymes, reduce your absorptive capacity because you don't need it, etc. And then we've mentioned the, the immune response and the ATP pumps. So what does this mean for us? Is these children are at risk for hypoglycemia, hypothermia, hypokalemia? And then cardiac failure, especially if the doctors start giving a lot of IV fluids, and of course, infection, because there's not a good immune system. Another thing that's important in physiology that I think, certainly when I was in medical school, this didn't get taught at all, but we see this quite often in the clinical setting. And I've had a, a master's student who actually looked at the prevalence of refeeding syndrome in children with severe acute malnutrition. And although it is not that common, it carries a very, very high mortality. So what is refeeding syndrome? So refeeding syndrome was actually described first at the end of the Second World War when people liberated the prisoner of war. Um, prisoners that um, in concentration camps and the Americans came with their Hershey bars and everything else and gave all this food to people who've been starving for a long time and these people died. So the research went into the refeeding syndrome and, and the physiology of this is basically you've had this prolonged starvation state, you've had this reductive adaptation and suddenly um, and, and you've had fluid shifts and you've had mineral shifts um, across your body and suddenly you get food and insulin starts being secreted and insulin uh, secretion leads to uptake of glucose, utilization of, of vitamins and most importantly, the cellular uptake of magnesium, phosphate and potassium. So the hallmarks of refeeding syndrome is a child that maybe is day two, day three, day four of, of admission, suddenly gets a lot worse. You look at their labs, their phosphate is in their boots, their magnesium is in their boots, their potassium may or may not be in their boots. And this is refeeding syndrome. And like I said, it carries a high mortality with it. Um, it leads to um, arrhythmias um, and many other complications.
So we want to avoid it if we can. And if we do get it, we want to detect it early and treat it as much as we can, which is what we're going to be talking about now, which is the management. So now I'm definitely going to have some yawns in the audience because the 10 steps are drilled into medical students um, until it comes out your ears. And the 10 steps were really designed around, I think the 99 or so it was that they came out. Um, and it was in an attempt to decrease the high amounts of mortality that were being experienced by sever severely malnourished children in those days, Quash and Marasmus in developing countries. So they somewhat um, proudly said, well, when we go into an African country where there's a, a starvation crisis and we set up our tents um, and we treat according to our principles, the mortality rate of our children is less than 5%. And in many parts of the world, mortality rates were more than 25% for these children. So what was going on? I think to some extent, you can't really compare the populations because in a country, for example, like South Africa, you might have children that are chronically malnourished, that have got HIV, that have got TB, etc. Versus in a war situation where a child would have grown normally until their supply got cut off and then they develop more acute malnutrition. So I think the base population is not quite the same. But be that as it's made, this um, initiative came along from, from the WHO and they came up with the 10 steps, which are reasonably easy to remember. And they sort of follow a chronological order. So in the first few days, what we really want to do is we want to treat and prevent hypoglycemia, hypothermia, dehydration, and start correcting our electrolyte imbalances and treat infection for everyone and um, start correcting macronutrient deficiencies and slowly start feeding. And the slowly start feeding was really to try and decrease the incidence of refeeding syndrome. And then um, it's more about catch up growth and um, sorting out discharge uh, and what's going to happen after discharge. So just a little bit more detail about some of these. Hypoglycemia, I think we don't realize when we see a child in our ward, in our admission ward, this child might arrive in my admission ward tends to be at like four o'clock. That's when there's a huge rush of patients. And why is that? It's not because mom didn't come early. She took the first taxi at six o'clock this morning and therefore child didn't have breakfast, went to the clinic, then had to wait for an ambulance or whatever to go to the hospital. In the hospital, they go stand in the queue to open a file. Then they get sent to an outpatient department where they sit in another queue. Someone recognizes this, this kid sick and eventually gets to the ward at four in the afternoon, having no intake the entire day, having no gluconeogenesis and no substrate to, to burn. So um, one of the strategies then is if you recognize that you've got a child with severe malnutrition in the queue, you should start feeding them if, immediately and you should feed them often. Do not give them any um, period of, of starvation, even three hours as long for a malnourished child to be without food intake. And then you monitor their HGTs just to prevent those hypoglycemias that we tend to see at 3 a.m. in the morning. Okay, and hand in hand with that goes hypothermia. So hypoglycemic babies also get hypothermia more often. We don't actually even have low reading thermometers. Uh, don't think any hospital, public hospital around Joburg has got one. Um, but I guess you go clinically. And um, what really works well in poorer resource settings is kangaroo mother care. Um, so consider that if you don't have access to incubators or um, overhead heaters with skin temperature monitoring, etc. And then the next step was dehydration. And dehydration is also a very controversial topic. So I mentioned earlier that 
children with muscle wasting might also have cardiac muscle wasting and therefore decreased cardiac reserve. So if you're going to give IV fluids to a patient who does not have adequate contractility in their heart, you're going to push them into failure. The other thing that is always mentioned is the total body sodium in these children is very high, so don't give too much sodium. Um, Resol Mel, by the way, is the malnutrition rehydration solution. It's basically the same as sorrel, but diluted in two liters instead of one liter, if you want to make it yourself. And then the recommendation is to rehydrate slowly, um, as long as they're not shocked, and rehydrate orally, and monitor very frequently. Check is what's the size of the liver? Is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Um, are we going back into shock? What's happening to our acidosis? If the child is shocked, then you're really in trouble. So now you're going to have to use um, IV fluids, and the recommendation at the moment is um, to give ringers lactate at 15 mol per kilo over one hour. And if that doesn't solve the shock, then you can repeat it. If that still doesn't uh, resolve the shock, then you really should consider septic shock and inotropes to try and uh, get the child's BP up. And again, you need to monitor very carefully. Does this child start having an increased heart rate and increased respiratory rate after um, giving a fluid bolus, then you might want to um, cut back on your fluid. Sorry, I saw a hand there. I'm not sure. Can you can you yes, ask a question? Sorry. Yeah. Yes, uh, go let for it. me just um, allow him to, to speak. Go ahead, Adam. Adam, you able to um, speak? You've got your hand up. Um, he's able to speak, but um, let me talk to him. Carry on. Um, okay, I'll, I'll do that. communicate with him here. Okay. Um, so this is a, a trial that really doesn't carry any good news. Um, it was a trial that was stopped early. It was done, it was uh, in Kenya. Um, and they looked at treatment of children with hypovolemic shock in and severe acute malnutrition. And at the time, the WHO recommendation was 15 mils per kilo over one hour. Um, they used half saline with 5% dextrose. I think people have definitely moved away from half saline for burlesing because it drops your sodium too quickly. Um, and then they said, you know, our children are still shocked after that. So let's have an experimental group where we give them isotonic fluid and we give them 10 mil per kilo every half hour until they're out of shock. And then we repeat it a maximum of four times. Unfortunately, what they saw is a very high mortality and a very high prevalence of unresolved shock in both groups. But the WHO group did worse than, than the, the experimental group. So really there was no good recommendation, and there still isn't any good recommendation in terms of managing hypovolemic shock in children with malnutrition. Um, apart from they need high care, they need very close monitoring, and they probably need anotropes sooner rather than later, which is obviously not easy in many settings. Okay, then some of the other um, things that we mention in terms of management, we try not to transfuse babies with severe acute malnutrition. Um, WHO says only if the hemoglobin is less than four. I would say uh, even if it's five or six, if the child's symptomatic, if they're in cardiac failure because of anemia, then I would transfuse them. But I would transfuse them slowly and probably only half volume with Lasix cover and make sure that they don't get fluid overloaded. Antibiotics, there's less argument about. Uh, antibiotics have been shown both in well babies with severe acute malnutrition, I say well between inverted commas, um, so children that are well enough to go home and be managed at home with ready-to-use therapeutic foods, 
will still have a better outcome if you treat them with antibiotics, regardless of whether they've got fever or regardless if you've, your CRP is low or whatever. Because remember, the immune system is suppressed, so you're not going to find the normal signs of infection in such children. So all of them should have antibiotics, even if it's just oral antibiotics. And anecdotally, there was a, a study that looked at um, children with Kwashiorkor at Baraguanas quite a few years ago now, and they looked at all their positive cultures, and it was more than a third of children with Kwashiorkor that had a UTI, a bacterial growth on the, um, so bacterially grown, proven UTI. Um, so it's very, very high in this population. Okay, we've mentioned to feeds, we go slow, we start low, we use F75, which basically means 75 kilocalories per 100 mils, and we give 100 to 130 mils per kilo per day, um, depending on how sick the baby is, and we only start increasing the calories once they start improving clinically, they start wanting to eat and interact, etc. Then electrolytes and micronutrients, we replace individually um, most of these. In some uh, settings, you might have mineral mixes and micronutrient mixes, which make things a lot easier, but we don't have access to that. And then there's the TB and HIV, and that hasn't made its way into the WHO 10 steps but every single child with severe acute malnutrition must be evaluated for both of these. So how do we do? This is a South African study looking at hospitals in the rural Eastern Cape and looking at the implementation of the 10 steps in these hospitals. So there's four hospitals and they, were, um, they had a baseline monitoring of their mortality rates and you can see that mortality rates were sort of between 30, that was the best, and 45% for children with Kwashiorkor and Marasma. So very, very high. Then they did training in each and every one of these hospitals onto the 10, into the 10 steps and, um, and then followed up to see what happened to the children. And you can see that in hospital A, well, in fact, in every hospital, there was a drop in mortality rates in 2002. Hospital A and B, however, maintained and even bettered that mortality rate, whereas C and D rebounded right up to their high levels from before. And, and the difference between these hospitals really was that hospital A and B had some sort of plan to um, for carry over of, of the uh, project into the subsequent years, whereas hospital C and D were probably run by community service doctors who left the next year and a new community service doctor didn't want to continue the program or whatever, um, and, and they did quite badly. So I think for our public health planners, that's a very useful study to try and see how you can make um, project more sustainable and how you really need to train the, the staff who's there permanently rather than the, the doctors who may or may not be there next year. This, is, um, this was my um, master study. So I looked at severe acute malnutrition in the three hospitals in the um, University of the Witz. Um, so Barra, Rahima Musa and Joburg Jen. And we looked at all children with um, severe acute malnutrition. We found um, quite a high percentage of children that were HIV positive. You see that on, in figure one there. And we found a marked difference in case fatality rate um, between the HIV positives and the HIV negatives. So the poor prognostic fact factors after multivariate analysis that remained important were the presence of HIV, the presence of pallor on admission, and the pre presence of shock. And that I think we've, we've seen in, in um, our, the study from Kenya, how difficult it is to manage shock in such children. So I think with that, I am going to stop and ask if anyone's got any questions for me. Um, thanks thank you very much, Tim. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I think perhaps your video will help and uh, yeah. we can see we if uh, that'll be great. Thanks. So any questions, you're free to raise your hands. I don't see any people having added their um, questions into the Q&A. Um, while you're thinking, uh, I'll just put up the poll again just to make sure we've got a, a sense of who's again here. Um, and I could just ask one or two questions uh, myself. Uh, you mentioned, um, Tim, the, the question of stunting. I was quite surprised by that, those statistics that you said that um, stunting was far more prevalent than wasting uh, in, in South Africa. I think those were South African numbers. Um, Correct. You mentioned briefly um, that, you know, it kind of impairs um, the sort of growth of children overall. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that we in primary care are being as vigilant of stunting. And I'm just wondering, you know, what your thoughts are, how we should deal with it, and also, um, you know, what are the implications for it later? A bit more in detail. Yes. So it's a very um, fascinating area, really, um, of, of research if we look at the research that's gone into stunting and the long-term consequences for health um, and the birth to 20 group in, in Soweto has done quite a lot of work on this. So some of the long-term outcomes just to mention is, so I've mentioned poorer cognitive capacity as an adult, um, poorer earning potential, um, but also things like more likely to be obese, more likely to get hypertension, and all sorts of uh, non-communicable diseases of adulthood have been linked to it as well. So it's clearly important. Um, the problem with stunting, I think, is it is not easy to get an accurate measurement of, uh, of length in the kids under two where it's more, most prevalent. So another study that was done at Barra was a master's student who went to the intake wards and re-measured everyone using proper technique and length boards. And it was mm. something like 40% of children were at least two or three centimeters more or less than, than what a doctor had measured in the intake ward. So mm. even in settings like at Baragwanath, we cannot measure length accurately. Um, so that's a big challenge. Really, you need length boards. You need two people to do it with proper technique. And, and only then can you, can you really assess, because you'll appreciate two centimeters is a very big difference in a one-year-old child and puts you, sure. you know, mm -hmm. in a completely different group. So I think on, if, for that reason, it's difficult to really measure it at primary care level. The other side is that uh, these studies looking at the long-term outcomes are always um, looking at broad populations. So what does it mean for the individual? If my child is short, does that mean that she's not going to be a doctor or a lawyer? Um, maybe mm. not. You know, it's, it's more at, at population level that you see that there is worse uh, cognitive outcome, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know if, if it's even necessary, really. And, and if we find it, what are we going to do about it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I suppose it's, it is a nutritional challenge. So one can just, you know, encourage mothers if you're diligent about measuring it, um, that, you know, not only the weight, but the height is actually something we need to deal with. Um, yeah. I suppose, well, yeah. and I think the tools, I'm not sure that we have uh, sufficient measuring tools, as you say, even in hospitals, that's challenged. So I guess in primary care, we're going to be probably even worse off um, both with the tool, tool and, the, and the technique. Yeah. So, and, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just thinking also that um, if you really, if you want to tackle uh, stunting, I think your your biggest uh, value for money is to improve sanitation, um, get rid of the bucket system, and and provide running water. That I think is yeah. is really going to make a massive difference. Yeah. Okay. Important. Um, the other question. I, I don't see any other questions yet. The other question that I had is obviously, um, you know, this was a lecture that was encouraged by, I think, Harun together with um, um, uh, Mimi Jordan um, to have for primary care. 
Uh, what do you think are the key take-home messages for us as primary care clinicians, probably in the non-hospital environment? Uh, what would you think are really important for us to, to keep in mind? Yeah, so I think we've, we've got a lot of um, lessons to learn from, from neighboring countries. So I briefly touched on it, um, in that in many countries, they have got to outpatient treatment of severe acute malnutrition. And, and what they do is they do an appetite test, they call it. They identify a child with severe acute malnutrition. They give them food, whatever it is, a certain amount, and they watch them and see if they want to eat and do eat the, the full amount. And if they do, then they're well enough to go home and they go home with ready to use therapeutic food, which is a, an oil-based uh, food. So it doesn't go off, doesn't need refrigeration, highly uh, calorie rich and enriched with all the micronutrients. And they treat malnutrition as outpatients. And it's only the children who have got complications, who are sick that go to hospital. In our setting, so I think for the primary care setting, obviously it's important to identify the severe acute malnutrition. Mm -hmm. I think the quash your core is difficult to miss. You, you know, you don't need a scale or anything. Mm -hmm. You see this irritable child with, with the skin lesions and the edema, mm -hmm. um, and that child will go to hospital. Um, mm -hmm. But what about these, a child who is known to have TB is one month on treatment and looks wasted. So I think in this setting, maybe we should be thinking about the appetite test. And as long as we're sure that this child can, if he's eating properly, if there, there's some access to supplementation through dietitian, social worker, whatever, um, then it might be safe to send him um, to for home care. So I think you asked about the take home messages. So I think it's important to be vigilant. A mid upper arm circumference is extremely easy to do. It's only valid between uh, six months and five years. Um, so don't do it on a one month old because they'll all be malnourished. Um, but it's a quick screen if you don't have access to a scale and a, and a measurement. Um, and other than that, plot them look at the chronic growth. And I think awareness is, is the number one thing that you don't want to miss this. And I always tell uh, my doctors in the ward that this is the child that I want you to see three times tonight, because he might look fine now, but he's going to die in the middle of the night without anyone expecting it. Um, mm. And yeah, that's the other important messages. They really need close, close monitoring. Mm. And if I might ask the last question, you know, um, being in a, a, well, a, a hospital that gets a fair number of referrals, I'm not sure that you get mostly from Soweto, but you probably get it north and, you know, uh, West and the like. But what do you see as the sort of common errors of doctors in dealing with malnutrition from primary care uh, in your referrals that you're seeing? What do you see as the biggest challenge, uh, apart from vigilance, which you've emphasized? I must say, I'm trying to, to remember back now. Um, Some of these little blopses that we make. Yeah, you know, I'm, the I'm trying do. to remember. I think um, I can't think of any examples yeah. offhand, but I think the biggest one there would be, you know, make sure that this child has something to eat before you organize a transport, which may or may not take a long time. Yeah, um, yeah. And our hospital is certainly very guilty of uh, taking a long time to issue files and no one's looking at a child in the queue when they're waiting for yeah. a file. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to be aware of that, that and um, keep the child warm. So take, tell the mom to put the child as a kangaroo sort of position and, and then to refer them yeah. as soon yeah. as possible, yeah. So thanks very much, uh, Tim. This has been very Pleasure. helpful. I think that uh, people have got a good sense of, um, you know, what, um, what they need to do, I think, uh, in general, in terms of being vigilant and measuring, uh, you know, diligently um, and checking that measurements are done accurately. I think many of times these, these little children happen to slip through, I think, the... Um, you know, EPI kind of system, and we don't see them until they're sick. Uh, 
And of course, then we refer them. And I think you pointed out some really useful things we can do before we send them off, um, you know, and, and noting the difficulties in the system. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. I think just to share again, you, you can see the, uh, the people that have joined us. I think we've got quite a wide range uh, of people. I think it's growing in terms of the numbers of people coming from outside of Johannesburg, even outside of Gauteng. Um, so we really appreciate that you find this val valuable, and I'm sure that um, that's pleasing to you. Um, I think that you know the West messages you were sharing are actually going beyond. I both think you also have seen that um, that uh, we're getting people from outside of South Africa, and as the African Forum for Primary Care, we are actually wanting to move to being an African platform that can that can actually share, I think, lots of expertise across the continent. Uh, just to quickly um, uh, see a mention, I think Brendan Matthews, I'm not sure that you've seen it. Uh, he says, uh, the biggest mistake I see in PHC is liberal fluid administration um, to Sam or Mam kids. Uh, so be careful of the, of the uh, you know, classification that the amount may be underestimated. Perhaps you can comment on that and then I'll just close with a quick mention of something. Yeah, yeah it's a, a very good Point. Thank you, Brendan. Um, and, and I would say not just the malnourished children. So people who are used to dealing with adults um, will easily put up a one liter bag of saline and then put the child in the ambulance. And, and that we definitely have seen where children come absolutely overloaded um, and, and in cardiac failure from unmonitored uh, infusions. We have moved very much away from intravenous fluids as much as we can. Oral rehydration is the way to go. Yeah, which I think means that, you know, one can do things, uh, you know, when you're seeing this child, you can do things and, and, and not think that the hospital is the only solution, so to say, um, mm -hmm. and that you can begin that before you even refer the patient. So yeah. great. I think that's a great take home message. I just want to share very quickly, um, you know, important thing. Uh, in the Afro PHC, uh, we are basically um, going to be, we are, we are working with uh, an organization called the World uh, Continuing Education Alliance, uh, which has got an enormous platform for um, continuing professional education across Africa. And we sort of collaborating with them. Um, we were going to move from next week to, uh, to their platform, but uh, we're going to move it to, uh, from, the, from January. Um, what we would, uh, and I think that's what's useful for um, our speakers is that um, they have a, a sort of um, a, you could say, database of 400,000 uh, healthcare workers across Africa and their meetings are, as webinars, are often a thousand people. Um, so it really would be useful for the messages uh, that we're sharing to actually get out to a lot more people across a uh, you know, many, many African countries. Um, so in terms, in terms of moving along in that direction, I just want to encourage all of you who've joined us today to get um, your colleagues and yourselves to join Afro PHC. It's free. Um, and what you can do is just indicate um, your interest in CPD, but just joining it alone, you will get uh, onto a list um, and be afforded access into the WCA platform. Um, which will allow you to get a whole lot of courses that are available there and our weekly Afro PHC CPD meetings. Um, and I think joining the huge 400,000 and thousand people at a time in our meetings, I think will be really great. And we'd certainly like to make our, the speakers who come and share this hour to have a really much bigger impact. Um, so please feel free to encourage people to join Afro PHC, the form if you go to Afro PHC or simply Google Afro PHC, you'll come to our website and you'll see that you can join it. And you can also see what our CPD program is like. So please feel free um, to join that. It's free, costs you nothing, um, but we really want you to benefit from all these great um, contributions by wonderful speakers like Tim DeMeyer. So Tim, thank you very much once again. And to all of you who've joined us today, thank you. Um, Keep wild, be safe, and see you next week. Bye-bye.